privacy and security online. It's not being paranoid if they really are out to get you, and they really are out to get you. That is one of the unfortunate truths. More people are more aware of this now than they used to be. I first did this presentation a year and a half ago, and since then, uh, the whole uh, Snowden thing happened in the United States, and people have started to realize that, yes, there are people, and even the government out there, really out to get you. Um, so, a bit about me. I'm Julian. Uh, I founded Freeform Solutions with a couple other people about 11 years ago. Uh, Freeform is a not-for-profit, and our mission is to help other not-for-profits use technology more effectively. So I've spent the last 11 years, well, and before that I was doing other work with not-for-profits, spent that time helping them build systems and manage information and, and take their processes and computerize them and, and do a lot of work with data. Databases are my own specialty. Um, this presentation, just is also a bit of background introduction, this started because a group that I talked to wanted someone to, they said, we're having a conference and the people are really very, you know, not, not a high level of computer literacy and I think they really need to hear about a lot of computer security things like, and then he rhymed off like 12 major questions like, are you ever anonymous online and, and you know, what's a good password and, and how do you avoid spam and how do you avoid virus, like it was sort of everything. I'm like, okay, how much time do you have? And it was an hour. So I'm like, mm, well, okay, we'll see what we can do just as sort of a, an overview. So. This presentation uh, focuses on sort of an overview of a bunch of different areas and it's designed to take it in whatever directions you want to go in and in as much detail as, as you might be comfortable with. So to get a sense of that, I'm wondering how many people here say have been using computers in their work for 10 years or more? Okay, so we've got some people with some experience. So, and uh, just to maybe calibrate that a different direction, how many of you, uh, as part of your work, uh, like maintain a website or a system of some kind, you have to log in and you have like administrator access to that kind of a system? Okay, most of you, all right. So we'll see what kind of questions and issues you want to get into and you know, we don't want to take it too, too techy, but mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe we can if you want, if that's, if that's where things are going. Um, so i like to start this with the story of Matt Honan. Some of you, since you're not, uh, you know, you didn't just fall off the truck yesterday, you might have heard parts of this story already. Um, in 2012, Matt Honan, who's a writer for Wired Magazine, I assume you guys know Wired Magazine. Uh, if those of you in internet land aren't sure, it's like Rolling Stone for geeks. Um, <laughs> so he, he knows what he's talking about. And he got massively hacked, as they say in the media about this, it's not really what I would call hacking, but uh, yeah, he, his whole identity online was basically wiped out, uh, and his laptop. And it's a really interesting story to see how it happened, uh, and I think raises a bunch of issues that anybody thinking about this stuff should be concerned about. So number one, the hackers, the people who did this, decided that his Twitter account, at Matt, was really cool, because uh, it is kind of cool, you know, to get like three letter your name. He's from Wired Magazine, so he was on Twitter like right at the beginning, so he got at Matt, and everybody else named Matt did not. So they thought, that's cool, we want that Twitter address. So in his Twitter account profile, they found some information that he had disclosed. So on the theme of privacy and what you disclose, he had disclosed the address of his personal website. That's it, sounds kind of innocuous, but that's, that's what he had disclosed. So they knew his Twitter name that they wanted and they knew his personal website address. Now, on the personal website, it had his Gmail address. So now they know, they know that part of his online identity. Now number four, they tried then, they go to Google and they tried to reset my password for his Gmail page. And at that time, uh, Google disclosed what the non-Google email would be that it would send the reset link to. Because when you, when you go to reset your, your Gmail password, it, it can't send you that to your Gmail. It has to send it somewhere else. So Google disclosed, you know, which account do you want us to send the re password reset to? 
And it said it was m hyphen hyphen n at me.com. So now they know that he's got a me.com address, which is associated with Apple. Uh, and you know, it's a good guess that the M and the N has something to do with Matt Homan, probably. So then they called up Amazon. Now this is not possible to do anymore what they did. And after this got widely publicized, Amazon changed its policies and so did Apple, as you'll see in a, a later step in this. But what they did at the time is they, is they called up Amazon and they said, I'm Matt Hone and I want to add a credit card to my Amazon account. At the time, Amazon would allow you to do this over the phone if you knew an email address that was associated with the Amazon account. Now they already had two email addresses that potentially were associated with the account and using that information, Amazon allowed them to do this. So they, they put a credit card onto his Amazon account, which doesn't sound too special until you find out the real hole in Amazon's security policies at the time. Then they called Amazon back, said, we want to add an email address to your Amazon, to my Amazon account. I'm Matt Honan, and Amazon let them add an email address. So now an email address that they control. Uh, they let him add this to his account because he knew a credit card that was associated with the account. Now in the previous step, he just added a credit card to the account that they knew. And now they're calling them back, and because they know that card number, they were allowed to add an email address. So that, that, was, a, that was a bit of a screw up on Amazon's part. Then they are able to log into the Amazon account at this point, because they can do a password reset using the email address that they had attached to the Amazon account. And on the Amazon profile, if you log into your own profile, you'll see this, it shows the last four digits of all the credit cards. It doesn't show the whole number, because that would be bad. It just shows the last four digits, right? So. Now they know the last four digits of some of his real credit cards, or at least, at least one, whatever one he had on the, on the account. Then they called Apple, and they claimed to be Matt. And to verify that he was Matt, Apple said, what's your billing address, and what's the last four digits of your credit card? So they got that from Amazon. So now uh, Apple allowed them to, uh, Apple basically gave them a reset for his Apple account, which is the one associated with the, uh, the me.com address. That's, that's, that's Apple. So with that temporary password that Apple had given them, then uh, they had access to the me.com account, and then they could do that reset. If you go remember way back at the beginning with Gmail, Gmail could be reset through his me.com account, so they reset his Gmail account's password and then they were able to reset the Twitter password because Twitter, tw his Twitter account had to reset through Gmail. So at that point, through only this personal information that, was, that he disclosed, uh, they were able to compromise all those accounts. And the really unfortunate part is to make it harder to find out what happened, uh, they then used the remote wiping capability that Apple gives you to erase your iPhone and erase your iPad and your laptop. So his laptop got wiped and his phone got wiped and, and they also uh, deleted his Gmail account. So that was, uh, that was pretty bad. Uh, it, it, he did get, Apple jumped on the bandwagon immediately and uh, aside from changing some of their policies, they also helped him recover his hard drive off his, uh, off his laptop, which was pretty decent of them, um, all things considered. Uh, but still, it's, uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty crazy story. Um, but when you're, thinking about, when you're thinking about privacy and security, a lot of people focus on the tech stuff. You know, do we have encrypted this, that, and the other technical formatted sideways, you know, in the cloud, etc. And the bottom line is, you know, in this case, there was, was there a super programmer person who, you know, cracked the uncrackable code and uploaded a virus and, and did all this? Um, of course not. No, this, this was achieved uh, using what's called social engineering, which has been the most powerful way that attackers compromise information since, like, forever, since as long as people have been trying to do this. Um, there was, in fact, last fall, I read about this uh, after Joyce had uh, invited me to give this presentation. I was reading about this a few weeks ago. Uh, there's a thief who stole 
$100,000 worth of Bitcoins by asking very nicely for them. Um, basically, I'll, I'll just read what it says here. Uh, according to a text copy of a chat session that was obtained by the Ottawa citizen, so this, this thief had started a tech support chat session with this company that had all these Bitcoins. And he, had, he basically called up their tech support and said, I'm so-and-so, I'd like access to the server to get at my coins, please. So Ottawa Citizen had a copy of the chat session for this, this tech support interaction that happened. And at no point during the two hours that they were having this conversation online, at no point was the caller asked to verify his identity. Uh, after being asked to do so, the technical support person gained access to the locked server pen, the place where the servers were, and plugged in a laptop to the servers and then manually gave the fraudster access to those servers. Uh, and then the fraudster person uh, cleaned out 149.94 bitcoins, which at the time was worth about $100,000 if he converted them to cash right away. Uh, the whole URL for the story is right there. But yeah, I, I couldn't believe it when I read that. And I'm sure the people who lost the money couldn't believe it either. Um, but you know, we, we have this tendency to trust people. Because kind of your whole life is based upon trust, really, with the people that you work with and your family and so on. But everything about security really has to be premised on the fact that you don't trust anybody. Which is why being paranoid is not actually that crazy when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, Although that example is particularly bad, like it's unbelievable that they didn't do anything. To it. Like even in the case of Matt Holman, you know, Amazon and Apple did ask for some stuff, right? They didn't do a very good job asking for the right stuff in a secure way, but they at least asked. In this case, they didn't even ask. There's a great book by a guy named called Kevin Mitnick, who for many years was called the most wanted hacker in the world. Um, and he spent a while in solitary confinement even for some of the stuff he did, which is pretty awful. Um, because you know, when you read about what he did, actually, like, yeah, solitary for that. Anyway, uh, it's called Ghost in the Wires, and it's an amazing book where he recounts stuff that he did breaking into the systems that he was able to gain access to. And most of what he did, although he was technically really, really smart, most of what he accomplished was through social engineering, not, uh, not by, you know, cracking the code. So. That's just to set the stage, and if you weren't sure sort of how vulnerable you might be to things, maybe that all those stories give you some idea that, yeah, crazy things can happen, and you don't necessarily have too much control over it, and you have to be pretty careful. Um, there's all these different things that we can talk about, uh, that I have little bits of information uh, about each one of them, and I'll read them out for those of you at the back, maybe hard to see. Email and spam, protecting your website, URLs, payments, social media, passwords, the cloud, protecting your computer, and are you ever really anonymous online? Um, I think these things are relevant to anyone here personally. They're also relevant to organizations you work with because you know, there's probably a whole bunch of passwords that your organization uses to log into accounts that you know, belong to the organization, not to people. You, know, you all have presumably websites, you all have office computers, you may or may not be using the cloud, etc. So there's different perspectives at the individual and organization level we can take on this. Uh, although a lot of it kind of boils down to the individual because when it comes down to it, it's, it's people that are carrying out these activities in your organization. And the organization, you know, if it has an account, it's essentially equivalent to a person, uh, any other individual person that might be using an account on an equivalent system. So the advice that's good for people is pretty transferable to organizations, but there are some differences. Anyway, so at this point, what tickles your fancy? Are there things that you thought when you were coming here, I really need to know about, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, we can talk about anything and everything, or I can just dive in in, in an order I'd suggest, but I, I want to make sure that we make it relevant and things that might be, you know, on top of your mind, we cover. So from live stream, payment, email, and are you ever really anonymous are the top topics? Payments, email, and are you ever really anonymous? Sure. Let's look at payments. Payments. So number one thing about payments online, as those of you know here, 
if you've been online for a while, you probably recognize HTTPS as opposed to HTTP with no S. You can see this at the top of your browser. It's very important because if there's no S, then it's not secure. Um, what does that mean? It means that the information transferred from your computer to the website uh, is either scrambled in some way that makes it not readable by other people, or it's just sent what's called in the clear or as plain text and can be read um, by other people who might be in between. Now that might not make a whole lot of sense to you necessarily if you don't know how the internet works behind the scenes because a lot of people I think believe, well, I'm connected to my bank website so my computer then connects to my bank. But it's not a tunnel. It's not like a, 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 you know, a straight line road from your computer to the bank. That connection is going through your own internet service provider, either at home or at the office, wherever you are, and then it's bouncing around through who knows where. It could be sent through the United States. Chances are, if you're connecting from Toronto to Vancouver, you know, a website that you know is in Vancouver, you're probably going through Chicago, whether you know it or not. Um, so there's all these bounces in the way. And you want to make sure that at any point where anybody might be able to intercept that message, that it's properly scrambled. So that's what the HTTPS is for. Your web browser will often these days also have like a lock icon of some kind. Uh, and it will display that to show you that the, the connection is locked up. That is the number one most important thing. If you don't know that, then, well, now you do. And that is definitely the most important thing. So yeah, no HTTPS, no lock symbol, then it's not secure. Um, don't ever store credit card information on a website. At least, well, don't ever. I don't necessarily want to tell you, you know, tell you what to do. You do it like this, you won't have any problems. But I think you need to think pretty carefully about why you're giving that such valuable information to whoever you're giving it to. Um, you know, Joyce said earlier, TechSoup doesn't actually store the information on their servers. Great, because then there's nothing to be compromised, which is fantastic. Um, and if you, I don't know if you do this or not, because I haven't ordered anything through TechSoup for, like, it's somebody else in our organization that does it. So I haven't done it for I don't know how long. But um, if you don't say on your site, we do not store this information, you might want to mention that, because it's, it's good for people to know, well, you know, what steps are you taking to, to protect their information. Um, a lot of places you put in that information, there will be a little check checkbox for, you know, remember this to make your checkout faster next time. A lot of places want you to do that because they want it to be easier for you to spend your money. But then you're releasing that information to, to who knows where. Um, so don't ever store the credit card information except PayPal. I, I throw this in there because it's an example of judging risk. PayPal you may perhaps trust more highly than your average store on the internet because PayPal's whole business is payments. So probably if anybody's like really you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on this. I would hope it's PayPal. Um, so, you know, in some places you can pay at, you know, store X, you can pay through PayPal. So maybe you want to store credit card information on PayPal to make that process easy and you trust PayPal enough and it makes your life easier. It's really a question of how much convenience is worth how much risk. And most security issues come down to that. What, how, in what way do you want to make your life easy? Um, how, what are you risking when you do that? There we go. That's just what I said. Um, yeah, now, I don't know if the person online who was thinking about payments had other particular questions about that that they had in mind, but that's sort of the, the basic overview of things to be mindful of. Unfortunately, a lot of this kind of stuff is, um, when it comes to that kind of interaction with a third party or a, a second party, um, you can only control so much, like how much you give them. The rest is kind of up to them. They are either storing that information securely or not, etc. Yeah. I was reading earlier today that there was a big vulnerability discovered in openness and oh. certificates. Is Thank you for reminding me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, question was for all of you in the internet land. Uh, there has been a vulnerability disclosed in something called OpenSSL which is actually one of the technologies that is used uh, to create the good old uh, HTTPS. Um, so, yeah, what happened was they found that versions of OpenSSL, which is the technology that stores and other organizations use on their server to achieve the HTTPS part, 
they found a vulnerability in that it's actually existed for a couple years um, and it allows people to basically see what's going on in the memory of the server uh, so it's not like it's not like oh that server now is wide open and everybody can just log in and find all your credit card information but it's definitely a major security vulnerability for those servers in general and exactly what people could use that exploit for, what they could achieve with it, it's going to depend on what the server is and how it's set up and a whole bunch of other stuff. But the bottom line is, yeah, there's this, there's this hole that they've found and it uh, is not so much anything that you, like as an individual person or even as an organization connecting to services out there, there's not a lot you can do about it because it really affects the people running the server and they need to update their software as soon as possible. I mean, we got a notice yesterday from one of our providers of software for our servers that we maintain uh, with a patch for this. Uh, so that was applied yesterday, like as soon as we got it. Uh, and so people who are maintaining these systems need to apply those things so that the hole goes away. Um, as, as far as you as an individual person, there's not anything you can do about it specifically because you don't control the servers. There are things that you might be worried about because you know, if your banking website is affected by this, somebody else might be attacking your banking website and getting information out of that computer that they shouldn't. Exactly what that information is is going to depend upon how that server is set up and what's going on in its own software. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we will hear over the next few weeks or months or a year that some, some big you know, theft of 100,000 credit card numbers or something has happened because somebody took advantage of this to, to do who knows what. Um, about two years ago, I wanted to get a really low limit credit card for online payments. Mm, yeah, that's another good technique, yeah. But I went to try to find one, yeah. and for some reason, maybe I was in the wrong place, but they did not have the three-digit code on the back. Ah. And then when I was trying to actually use it, you have to have the three-digit code. It's pretty, most I, places do so, want that now, yeah. Yeah, so do yeah. you know of any low credit cards that... Not have, personally, no. Yeah, that just seems... So, so I it is tactically the right kind of thing to do. Like, if you are going to expose that information, then you're limiting your risk. But then but, I got one of yeah. the prepaid... Yeah. Cards, yeah. But it was so expensive. It was something like two dollars and fifty cents for every transaction. Yeah. So it was just stupid. Yeah. So I, I was hoping maybe you would. No. No. I. The the three digit code thing has become so common. Yeah. That I'm surprised. At least you said it was a couple years ago. If you looked again now, I would hope that they brought that kind of up to speed because, like, it's everywhere. You know. Uh, like it's been about five or six years since that became pretty common and now it's ubiquitous. I, I saw something, I forget what it was, like a couple weeks ago where he didn't ask for it and I'm like, I was, I was looking for it. I thought I missed something. It's like, where's the box for the three number code? And so it's, uh, so hopefully they have addressed that. I mean, uh, your bank or somebody ought to be able to tell you what the story is. Because uh, that's also going to vary, I'm sure, by issuer. What, what are the features? and capabilities the different products they offer. Yeah. Anything else about payments from the web or elsewhere? All good? Let's uh, back out of that. Now, email and spam and are you ever anonymous? Uh, let's, let's look at anonymous. Especially in light of the, the Snowden thing, this is a, a hot topic. Um, so are you ever anonymous online? That's the answer, in a nutshell. <laughs> Which is kind of obvious when you think about it, um, because it's a communications medium. So when you request some information, like a web page, a server somewhere on the internet that you're requesting that information from has to know where to send the information back to you. Like, if you were totally anonymous, you'd send out this request and the server would go, great. I have no idea who you are. I don't know where to send that. So thanks for asking, but I can't help you. So yeah, there's always something. Uh, the IP address. Uh, it's think of it like an internet phone number. Uh, it's always sent with your requests, so that the computers you're talking to know where to send the information back to. 
Now, that number doesn't necessarily identify you, because chances are, uh, even now in a workplace, it may be more authoritative, because chances are in a workplace, your internet connection might have what's called a static IP address, which means it just doesn't change. So today, next week, next month, next year, same number. Uh, so if you look through the communication logs of other computers on the internet and you find that number, that probably means your workplace, chances are. Uh, home internet connections are not usually using a static IP address, but they can sometimes. Uh, some geeky people want them to so that you can run a server or something out of your own house and stuff like that. Um, now, there is this project called Tor, uh, which Snowden talked about. It's been around for a while. Uh, it's a very interesting project. I'd be happy to talk about the technical parts of that if people are interested. But the bottom line is, if you go to this website and you use the software that they have there, then that can make your activities much harder sort of impossible to really get a hold of online. It basically works by sending your connections through multiple servers before it gets to the one you want to talk to. So you'd have to backtrace that through all of the servers that were involved, and many of those are run by people who just are not logging anything. So there would be no record of the chain of IP addresses. So it's, it's a very clever, simple approach to this. Although it slows down your connections too, because you've got all those extra hops on every connection you're making. But if you're really concerned about, about privacy, if you work, say, at a not-for-profit organization that's working on human rights issues in some parts of the world, it might be important to be anonymous in some of your interactions. Uh, that's a very important piece of software. Um, you also leave behind all kinds of clues on your own computer. Anytime you do any, anytime you even like turn on your computer and log in, there's all kinds of stuff going on behind the scenes that a lot of which I don't even know about. A friend of mine from university uh, went to work for first the Canadian version of the NSA and then the RCMP. And I've talked with him about this stuff and, and the, the stories he tells about what they can pull off things is freaky. Uh, there, was one, there was one thing he told me about uh, a, a, a tape, actual memory tape, a magnetic tape memory drive thing for a computer that someone had like, you know, stomped on and thrown out a window and like when the police were banging down the door and it was like in pieces and all this, all this stuff. Six months later, after somebody spent six months putting all the pieces back together, they, they got information off that. So yeah, what, what it's possible to lift off things is pretty freaky. Um, so there's, there's browser cookies. Sorry, I went ahead and I didn't, didn't talk about that. Um, Browser cookies, if you don't know, cookies, oddly named, are not for eating. They are bits of information that your web browser will leave behind on your computer at the request of websites you visit. So if you ever see a website and it's got this thing uh, where you got username and password and then a little checkbox, remember me, it's remembering you probably by setting a cookie on your web, on, in your computer uh, to remember that you've been to that website and you are currently logged in and when you go again, the cookie goes back to the website and, and uh, basically logs you in automatically. Um, now that's a clue on your computer. Like no one else on the internet is going to get that bit of information or any other information like it. A lot of ads actually track this. You'll see customized ads on different websites because you've been to a website where that company had an ad. Then you go to another website where the company runs ads so they'll tailor them based on the websites you visited and stuff like this. But, so there's different bits of information that get stored in cookies and get shared in different ways, but fundamentally cookies don't get shared, shouldn't get shared with uh, any website other than the one that's set. So it's not like if you go to Google and you search for something you'd rather somebody didn't know you were searching for, that another website is going to be able to get that cookie. Only Google gets that. So you just have to worry about whether Google knows those things, not, you know, not whether everybody on the internet does. That information, since it's on your computer, is available if somebody forensically went through your computer to see what's going on. Well, all the cookies are there, and who knows what they'd figure out from that. Um, Flash cookies. It's not just your web browser that sets cookies. Adobe Flash that is used for movies and videos on lots of sites and ads on some sites. Flash sets its own cookies, which are much harder to get rid of 
Uh, browser cookies, you can usually, you know, if you Google how to clear cookies in Firefox or whatever your browser is, you'll find a step-by-step -step for how to do that. Getting rid of flash cookies is possible, but it's much, much more, there's many more steps. It's not hard, but there's a lot more steps. Um, there's also these private browsing modes that you may or may not be aware of. A lot of browsers for the last couple of years have features where you can basically turn on anonymous browsing or private browsing or porn mode, some people call it. Um, now, what that does is it doesn't store any cookies, but it will still store flash cookies. Uh, and it doesn't record any history in your web browser. I mean, I'm not even, I didn't even mention your browser history, because that's like so old, I assumed everybody knows that, but there is a history in your web browser. It doesn't never mind cookies or anything else. There's just a history of all the websites you visited. So if you're in private browsing mode, there won't be a history. There won't be cookies. Your browser is not going to store any information. Uh, but you're still leaving behind your IP address and all those servers, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, your own ISP is going to have logs of, of this stuff. Bell actually is a big thing in the fall where Bell said, we are definitely going to be logging all of your web activities so we can serve better ads to you, they said. What they really want to do, I think, is sell that information to other people. But they specifically said, we're going to track it all. Like, as if they probably weren't already in some respects, but they've obviously stepped that up a level because they felt they had to actually tell you. So your ISP definitely knows what you're up to. Unless you're using Tor. Um, and your physical location can also be revealed. There's a bit under protecting your computer where there's an example of that. But yeah, it's possible basically to cross-reference your IP address with databases that show where in the world that IP address exists. So uh, that's kind of freaky. So a device that has no GPS can still be geolocated based on its IP address, which is very, very, very freaky. Yeah? Just vaguely, right? Not oh, pretty accurately. And I'll tell that story when we get to protect, uh, yeah, protecting your computer. Yeah. So I have Bell 5 and it's got the internet. Mm -hmm. And it's got this one virus scan, which I believe is the North in these days. Oh, no, yeah. McAfee. They keep switching. It's McAfee now. And Whichever one slows down your computer most. That seems yeah. to be the one that they mm -hmm. want to use. So <laughs> I close my browser, but I usually leave my computer running. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's running and it's on the internet, does that make it? Well, yeah, technically speaking, if it's connected to the internet, then in theory somebody could find a way through to get to it. But there's no browser open. Well, it's not so much about the browser. It's like if there's a wire plugged in, it's connected to the internet. And then it's a question of what software is running on the computer that will respond to communications over the wire. Um, this is one of the things that's confusing, I think, for so many people about servers. People talk about servers, and you have this vision of this huge box in some room with lots of fans and stuff. But then you also talk about the web server software and other stuff like that. And it's very confusing because the server is the box, but then any software that is running on the box that answers requests is called server software. So you've got a server computer running several server softwares. It's like, so it comes down to that software question. Like you can run server software on that laptop. Like you can run server software on anything. It's just, you know, from an engineering point of view, you wouldn't use that laptop for you know, your company's web server because you want a computer that's more powerful. Um, but at a software level, yeah, you just need to be connected and you need software that's going to answer the request. Um, at a home, on a home connection or even on a work connection that's set up in roughly the same way, if it's a small office and like you're with Bell and you've got the, the five connection box that they give you, you plug the phone line into that and then you plug wires from there to all your computers, or it's got Wi-Fi. Yeah. So that box, called they call it the connection hub, and it's basically what we call a router. And that means it's routing connections out to different parts of your own local network. Now at home, you might just have one computer plugged into that, but it's still a network of one. And the important thing is you've got that box in between you and the outside world, because it means that anybody who's connecting has to first go through the box, and then the box has to decide to route the traffic to your machine. And that's unlikely to happen because of how these things are set up. The typical way all those things are set up by default is they don't allow any connections through to your computers unless you specifically open them up. Even if you're using wireless. Yeah, wire, yeah whether it's wireless or wired, doesn't really matter as far as the router is concerned. It's just a different 
physical mechanism of communicating to, to the devices. Yeah. Anything else on any of that? Um, email and spam was the other one that someone had brought up, and then also we want to talk about protecting your computer. But before we go into email and spam, there's sort of a sort of a there's a prerequisite. There's URLs 101 that I think you really need to know before we go into emails and spam. And you know, for that matter, well, viruses too, sort of, because you get you know a lot of spam is trying to get you to install stuff. But it's really the URLs that it all comes down to. This is like a soapbox of mine. Um, URLs, also known as links, addresses, site names, anything that's like www dot something, or like blah blah dot net, or you know those things. That's the URL, and that's one that everybody knows, right? And it has several different parts, and you read them backwards. You read them at least backwards for normal English speakers and most languages. Uh, you read them right to left. Top level domain is that one, .com. So this is some address in the .com space, which is why you see the same address in different places. You see Google.com, Google.org, Google.net. I haven't actually tried lately, but I, I would bet a lot of money that if you type Google.net into a web browser, it's going to take you to the same place because they're using all these different addresses to lead you to the same place. Yeah, and other other ones that there are. Org, net, CA, gov, edu, tv, co-op, biz, name, info, fm, ly, uh, and so on and so on and so on. There's a few hundred. And they recently opened it up, actually, so that uh, if you pay enough money, you can start your own. It's like $186,000 or something to start a registry for your own top-level domain. Uh, so the next part is the domain name, the part that we mostly think of, Google. And then the subdomain www in this case. Sometimes you've probably seen web addresses where it's you know something else dot main name dot whatever. Uh, some we set up some things for some clients where they have a whole series of sites, and so they want to have you know our site number one dot our name dot com, and then our site number two dot our name dot com, and so on. So sometimes there's a subdomain. Sometimes it's sort of www, which is a bit of a throwaway. Sometimes there is no subdomain. And then there's protocol, HTTP. Or if you're connecting to your bank, you want it to be HTTP. <laughs> you do. You totally do. Um, so, skill testing question. Which one's the real URL for the TD bank? And which one was literally copied out of a spam message that I got? Who votes for the top one being the real one? Who votes for the bottom one being the real one? Maybe, yes. It's hard to tell. It can't be hard to tell, can't it? What you have to remember is that you read them from right to left. And so you got to pick up, you also have to know, this is the sort of trick question part that I left out. Um, I should do this with the mouse so the people on the, on the internet can see. Everything after the slash, it's not part of the domain name. That wasn't part of my description of what is a domain name. Everything after the slash, you can ignore it. Whatever it says after the slash really doesn't matter as far as figuring out the domain name. All that matters is up to the first slash and then you read backwards. So we've got td.com and we've got cc.banksite. So that kind of gives it away, doesn't it? That's TD Canada Trust. That is not. And yeah, I underlined them there. That is the name that belongs to TD Canada Trust. If you're not sure, open up another web browser window, type in td.com, and you'll get the TD Canada Trust website. Whereas that one, you know, that's, that's the part. And yeah, it's true. You got td.com right here. And that doesn't matter, because this is a subdomain, and that's a secondary subdomain and a tertiary subdomain. Yeah, that's the other part of the trick question. You can have multiple subdomains. I didn't, I didn't reveal that, that part of it. So yeah, this is bank site, TLD is .cc, wherever that's from, probably some island nation in the Pacific. Run away. Okay, so with that in mind, that's like really important for understanding emails and spam because to cut to the chase, and like this is very important for everybody personally and at work because at work, you still get spam and you still get these messages that are trying to trick you into doing who knows what 
and a lot of them are designed to infect your computer with something uh, that is probably trying to record where you're going or just do who knows what or maybe log into your, your organization's website. Um, so it's bad if you know you get this on your home computer, but it can actually, if it happens on a work computer, it, it could say compromise your organization's website. Even though your website is perfectly secure, it's because your computer got compromised that bad things happen. And the number one way to not get infected is the good old don't open suspicious attachments, um, as people probably told you. But the fundamental question is what counts as suspicious? Remember, you're supposed to be paranoid, right? So everything is suspicious. <laughs> but it's true, because your friends are going to get a virus, and that virus is going to send messages to everyone in your friend's address book. So that includes you and your mom and, you know, so on. And so you get a message from your friend saying, hey, I found this cool whatever. And you think, great. But if that message didn't contain information that only the sender would know, then it's suspicious. Or, you know, I've sent messages to my father-in-law that don't contain information that only I would know. But I told him on the phone I was going to send it or something. Like, there's some reason that you're expecting it or, you know, it, it, it's referring to things that only that person would know so you can rely on it. Um, you get a message from someone you only talk to occasionally, be a little paranoid because maybe they got a virus. Um, it's really easy to fake email. The email system was designed in the 1970s when nobody thought about the need for any security on this because it was just a little sort of basically a private club for the people who ran the like hundred and something servers that existed in the whole world at the time. So they just, you know, sent messages back and forth. There's no security built into email at all. Therefore, it's super easy to fake email. So you want to be, if you really want to know for sure, you should call up what's called the headers of the message. Uh, and any email program will give you access to this information somewhere. It'll be in the menu under like, you know, uh, view message source or view headers or something. Uh, or you right click on the message and there'll be a pop-up menu with options. There'll be some way to get this info. And it looks kind of scary, but if you remember the URL lesson, then it's actually not too hard to track what's going on here. Um, this message started at utoronto.ca. So that's the University of Toronto. That is the domain that belongs to them. And what's, what the headers tell you is it was received by this person and then re from this, received from, by this, from this, received from this. So it's like the whole history of the message in the header. It started down here. It was then received also by another computer at the University of Toronto. Because remember I said it's not a straight line, right? It's bouncing through lots of different things. Uh, then it goes to another computer at the University of Toronto. And it was received from there by Google. This is a message that was sent to me. And all of our email is actually hosted on Google. So that makes sense. The University of Toronto routes it through a few things and then bounces it to Google. And then Google delivered it to freeform.ca. That's me. So it's a huge amount of information, but if you look for the URLs and you sort of read them in, in the order, then you can tell that, yeah, this is a bona fide message. Um, whereas that information will be missing from most spam messages, or, you know, or if they've left it in, it'll probably reveal that it's not really the TD bank that's emailing you. Um, headers can be faked as well. Email is just a rotten security mechanism. Uh, there's other systems called, something called PGP, which you might want to look at if you're really concerned about secure email. But you have to get all your friends to use PGP as well. So it's kind of like a multi-level marketing scheme. Um, but it, it, is, it is good for that kind of security. Uh, the bottom line is those links. Uh, so either in the headers or you look in the message. And so attachments are like, you don't, you don't do attachments. You just know not to deal with suspicious attachments. You ignore those. But the links in the messages, it's a little maybe harder to tell. And just about every program will have some way, if you put your mouse on the link, but don't click it, it should tell you like at the bottom of the window or something, what is the address that this link is going to take me to. And then you can apply your genius knowledge of URLs to tell you that it's not the TD website, and then you don't click it. Um, so yeah, what I just said, hover over the links, your mail program will give you some way of telling you what that really is. Uh, I think on a lot of webmail programs like Gmail, it'll just give you a little hover thing right there where your mouse is. It'll show you that kind of thing. And yeah, if it's, if it's at all suspicious, then just don't click it. 
Uh, and honestly, um, that is the most important thing with all that kind of stuff because if you if you're aware enough not to get infected in the first place, I don't even run a virus scanner on my computer because it slows it down too much. It just really annoys me and it interrupts what I'm doing and I, yeah, so I just very, very careful. I'm paranoid, right? The proper amount of paranoia applied in the right place will be a good thing. Yeah? The domain on TLD in the list. TLD. Top level domain, .com, .net, .org, .cc, yeah. Um, two other things I tell people is that when, and, and it's a version of what you've got right yeah. here, which is that if the link in the email is the actual web address, like underlined, mm -hmm. and you hover over it and it's what you see displayed as what is really going to be yeah. is different from what you see in that That's, web address, it's yes. almost certainly fake. Oh, um, yeah, it's, it's, I would, yeah, it's like almost like if yeah, if you think about it technically, there's maybe some scenario in which they might be different, but that's very true. If the link in the email is you know blah 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 dot com, and then the link at the bottom is not blah 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 dot com, like yeah, this is just this is bad news. It, it's got to be. It should be what it says it is. There, um, there's there's a possible exception, which is if you use um, email mass sending program. Yeah, um, it may go to an intermediate contact, thing. They're yeah. going to they're going to change the link so that yeah. they can track who clicked on what. Yeah. But the lesson from that is do not, your, your link text in your email, don't use a, a URL. Use some text. Yes. You know? Yes. Because the, when, when spam checkers see that, they're more likely to think you're spam if they see exactly that, the That's URL a, that got changed. To very good else. tip for organizations sending newsletters or any mass mail, yeah, is to, it, yeah, if, Putting in a full URL, some people might have recommended that because it's sort of full disclosure. You're being transparent, but yeah, if there's any interruption, uh, any changing of that behind the scenes, then it could be misidentified as spam. The other aspect of that is uh, the inverse is not true. Like if if the link is different from the little address that pops up, then yeah, that's that's very suspicious. If they're the same. It might still be very suspicious because it might just be totally the wrong address, you know, not the bank that said it was. But if it's yeah. text and the link, then it isn't. No, if it's text, then it's you still just go by whatever the hover right. pop-up thing is because the, there's some destination. What you ultimately want to know is what's the destination for this link and is that anywhere that I really want to go or is it the organization that is trying to get me to do this? Um, to close the loop on the, on the organization aspect of this, the most common infection method for websites that I've seen in the last few years uh, is uh, people's computers at their office get infected with something that is reading passwords. As you type in stuff, it's just tracking what people are typing and it's sending all that to a home base somewhere. And so your website might be you know, gold-plated, totally secure, but the computer you're using to connect to the website it's dutifully sending your webmaster password to who knows who. And then we've heard from people, it's like, we don't know how our website was infected, but blah, 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 you know, this has changed on this page and like all kinds of bad things are happening. And in a lot of those cases, it really appears as if what must have happened is somebody got a hold of the webmaster account. And the most common way that that happens is through infected computers. So it's very important that your computers are clean. And I'm certainly not suggesting people don't run virus programs because that's a really good precaution. <laughs> it's just, I've been doing this for a really long time, and for me, I find they're just a little bit in the way. Um, but you want to have you want to have the computer locked up in such a way that you're confident it's secure. It, it, you may wish to go as far as to have a computer that you use only for that purpose, and people don't use that computer for other kinds of regular work. Because if no one's just doing general web browsing and email on that computer, they're only managing your website from that computer, chances are they're not going to get anything on it because you're only using it for that one clean purpose so yeah one other thing about attachments is hide extensions for known file types in windows you want that turned off mm. it's a setting that you can get to from yes. options in windows explorer yes because what it does is for instance if that's turned on which is a default yes. in windows which is stupid yes um if somebody sends you an attachment, for instance, called, you know, coolpicture.bmp.exe, right. 
it'll show up as just coolpicture.bmp right. when you're looking at the attachment. You'll think it's a cool picture. You'll double click on yeah. it. It's a program that installs a virus. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the question there, the issue is um, about file extensions in uh, Windows, uh, which is not to be confused with .com, .org, .net, which are these three-letter extensions on, on website names. Um, yeah, the, the, the bad thing is Windows, by default, wants to hide these extra extensions that are part of a file name. And the, the dangerous thing there is that means you can, people can fake you out with an attachment that looks like it's one kind of file when it's really another kind of file. Um, so that is something you want to, it's called, um, it's called hide, hide file extensions. If you search on Google or somewhere how to show file extensions in Windows, it is a good precaution to do that. It'll make things look messier, like Microsoft has hidden this because uh, they want to make their computers as clean and pretty and as easy to use for everybody as possible. But it a, is a really critical bit of information that, that is hidden. Um, Sorry, just a, a question from the live stream audience. Yeah. Um, it's more of a concern, and if you can speak to the top of your head. Mm -hmm. So things like, for example, Google, they have um, email hosting. So if yep. you are using Google for your email, yep. does that also mean that Google has access to your emails? Yep. Is that a concern? <laughs> Well, how much convenience is worth how much risk? <laughs> um, it does mean that Google has your email because, well, it's on their computers. Like, they have access to it. Now, they pledge that no one is sitting there reading your email, uh, and, and, you know, personally. Uh, but they certainly do have computers that are reading your email and trying to figure out what ads you might like uh, and things like that. Um, tracking what websites you go to, what links you click on, etc. So they try to aggregate a lot of this and they try to automate a lot of this. Uh, but the bottom line is, yeah, if you use Google for email, your computers are not just on your computer, they're also on Google's computers, which are totally out of your control. They're in the United States, they're subject to search and seizure rules according to secret US courts that don't require warrants, etc., etc. So, you know, not that the Canadian government would ever deny a request from the United States if one was made to, to uh, you know, retrieve certain information. But anyway, a lot, of, a lot of some organizations, we do hear this uh, from organizations we work with, that they specifically want web servers in Canada, just because there's an extra layer there against some of the weird things that happen in the United States. Um, is it something to be concerned about? Well, when you send that message from you in Toronto, say, to your mom in Vancouver, like I said before, the message is probably going through Chicago anyway. The NSA has probably picked up that message somewhere along the way because it went through some server in the United States that they have some listening ears on. And so, like, email is not fundamentally secret or private unless you're using something like PGP, which I mentioned before. PGP stands for pretty good privacy. Uh, and it's a way of scrambling your message, kind of like the HTTPS thing. HTTPS for sending payments to websites, um, the PGP will scramble the email in a similar kind of, uh, similar kind of process. The, the reason I said you also have to get all your friends to use it is because what your friends get is a scrambled message and they have to unscramble it on their end. So uh, that's, that's the downside. But yeah, if you're really concerned about privacy of that kind of information, then you want to use something like BGP, which is a form of encryption. Essentially, any information that is not encrypted is readable by whoever has it. So if it's only on your computer, that's fine. Uh, but if you're putting information on other people's devices or sending it through a communication network that other people could intercept and that information is not encrypted, then anybody who has that part of the network or that computer could read it, in theory. So encryption is the answer to that, sort of, but it's not an easy answer. Okay, so thanks. All right. Um, protecting your computer, we were going to jump over here. Uh, so, which kind of dovetails with um, the whole vi uh, viruses and some of the other things we've been talking about. Protecting your computer, the number one thing for protecting your computer, and this especially goes for your work computers, is backups. When was the last time you all backed up? An hour before you came here, right? <laughs> Yesterday. All right. <laughs> yeah, um, backups are super important because it doesn't matter if it's 
somebody stealing the information, destroying the computer by some malicious means, or just the hard drive fails, or uh, the new intern accidentally deleted that folder, or like who knows what. Um, there's all kinds of reasons you want to have a good backup process in place. Um, and everybody always goes, yeah, that's, that's good, but I'm really busy until it's happened to them. And then it becomes their number one priority. Uh, so, you know, backups, how you back up information is just way too big a topic to really suggest anything in particular because it depends on what kind of information and your computer infrastructure and how technically savvy the people involved are. But you want to track down the people who can answer these questions for you and get backups in place. That's the number one thing. The virus scanner, talk about this. If you are using one, which is certainly recommended, uh, you want to keep it up to date. It doesn't do you much good if it's not up to date because uh, new viruses and things are happening all the time. And all these softwares have some way in their settings, there'll be some checkbox or some option somewhere that says, you know, update automatically, you know, at 3 a.m. If you leave your computer on, like, like you were saying, it'll just do it automatically for you. That's one advantage of leaving it on all the time is some of these things can just happen for you. Um, now, the software that's on your computer has access to what your computer is doing. So this is sort of an example of why you don't want viruses near your computer. Because if a virus is just a program, like any other program. It's just one that you didn't want installed. That's all. But once a program is on your computer, OK, but like, so what? I, know, I, I don't double click on its icons, so how bad could that be, right? But the fact is, once software is on your computer, all bets are off. And this is an example of, uh, of why. Now, this, uh, this software is called PrayProject.com. And it's a program for remotely monitoring your computer phone when it's stolen. It's a very handy piece of software if you and your organization send laptops out. Or you know, maybe you have a lot of information on mobile phones. You can install it on your phone. And your phone will basically phone home when you declare that it's stolen. Um, so it's, it's rather handy. Um, and I'll show you some of the things it does. But keep in mind, so it, it's useful for you know, the my device was stolen scenario. It's also a good example of if there's software on your computer, this is what potentially it could do. Um, so on the Prey website, if, you, if you've installed this on your computer, as I did way back when, and you go to the Prey website, and you say, my computer is stolen, you tell it that's the website, then basically your computer will then tell the website where it is and what's going on, various things like that. Um, so here's my IP address. Uh, the, the computer that was stolen uh, is, is connected to the internet through this IP address. And in fact, here's a handy map. You're asking how accurate this stuff is. That is exactly where my house is. And I have no GPS on that laptop. Now, how does that happen? I saw this, and, and this was a few years ago when I first did this, and I thought, like, how does it know that? So a bit of scratching later, I, I got the answer. Um, Google and other people are keeping huge databases of IP addresses. And they're basically uh, cross-indexing them with the GPS coordinates of devices that have connected from that address in the past. This is all thanks to my wife's BlackBerry. She connected to our home Wi-Fi. Her BlackBerry had GPS. Google logged that. I connected to the internet. Google says, oh, that address? I know where that is. So that's, you know, if you have an IP address, potentially it could be geolocated to a very high degree of accuracy. Um, now, this is a home IP address, so it's not static. It's going to change. Like the, the, I mean, what I mean is the IP address for my house is going to change. It's not the same forever. So you know, if you checked it today, this IP address would not lead to my house. But at the time I did this, it was recent enough to when my wife had connected that Google figured it out. And that's the thing. Like We use these mobile devices all the time. My IP address has probably changed a dozen times since then. But my wife is still connecting to the internet with their BlackBerry from our house. So every time that happens, Google will update its little records. So there's a bit of lag time there, but you know, it's still, it's still there. Anyway, what can the software do if software is on your computer? And what does Prey do? It, it can show you all this kind of information. Software on your computer. Yeah, without GPS, you can be geolocated. 
Um, software on your computer uh, can access all the resources and information that is on your computer, including the camera. It'll show you, Prey will show you pictures of the nefarious looking people who <laughs> stole your laptop. Um, <laughs> is that even if your camera's not on? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. There's lots of fun things that software can do once it's on your computer. If it's installed a certain way, depending on the security protocols of how your computer is set up and so on. So imagine it wasn't prey, it was a virus. There was a big thing a couple years ago that the Chinese government had, well, they thought it was the Chinese government, who knows? There's lots of media hype about these things. But somebody had made some virus that was going around like US research institutions, government research institutions, and was, you know, I remember, I remember the media thing on it uh, saying, and it could take pictures with the webcam, and the light didn't even turn on. And I'm thinking, you actually believe that like the light is somehow physically connected to the sensor mechanism? Like that's sort of a physical connection. That if the sensor's on, the light has to be on. No, that's just that's just part of how the people who made it decided that they wire it up a certain way and the light will turn on for convenience. But you know, it's a whole other engineering problem if you want to force the light to go on when the sensor's active. You know, so. <laughs> Yeah, it can do all kinds of different things. And it will also uh, show you a screenshot there of what's on the screen. It'll show you uh, the files that you've accessed, all kinds of stuff. So it's great, you know, if you've lost your laptop, you get a ton of information. And there are people, there's lots of stories on the internet of people who have contacted the police and used this information to get their laptop back. There's even people who have not contacted the police and used this information to get their laptop <laughs> back. So who is the Prey Project? Who are they? Uh, it's an open source group, so it's not controlled by any particular company or organization. It's a volunteer effort of people who want to have this software, and they continue to make it better and release it free of charge so that you can use it. So there could be hackers on there? Well, the thing is with open source stuff is if anybody was trying to slip something in there that was not good, the other people using the software would be able to tell because it's all open. That's the point of open source, is there's no secrets in the software. Everybody can, everybody who's participating can review everything that's going on in the software. So somebody did try to submit something that would circumvent what the software's trying to do. Other people, knowledgeable people who are part of the project would notice that, presumably, uh, and red flag it and you know disallow it or remove it or whatever. Um, so pray, does all of this to help you find your computer or phone, but viruses and other software, are, viruses are software on your computer too. They can do this without your consent, which is why you don't want them anywhere near your computer. Um, now we talk about encryption. This is another uh, thing that may be useful, especially if you have laptops in your organization and you say go around and do surveys with clients in their homes or you know, there's lots of different scenarios where people take mobile devices out of your office to some other place, do some work, you've got important data on there, maybe people's health information, maybe just even just birth dates, you know, birth dates, social insurance numbers, simple information like that is, well, and there's laws in Canada about what you have to do to protect the privacy of, of people's information that you collect. So any device that is leaving your physical control and going out there into the world and potentially being left in the backseat of a car or, um, yeah, telephone booth, if you don't have a phone for some reason. Um, you know, all, all that kind of, like any of those kind of scenarios. Uh, TrueCrypt is a very useful piece of software that will encrypt the hard drive of the device. Uh, when you use TrueCrypt, what happens is you turn on the device, the laptop, presumably, and the first thing you do is you type in the TrueCrypt password, some password you make up. We'll talk about passwords in a minute. You'll see what kind of password you need to make up. Um, you type that in first, and then TrueCrypt lets the rest of everything happen on your computer. If you don't type in the right password, the computer will not start. It's not just that it won't start, it's that the information on the computer is not readable, even if somebody ripped the hard drive out and tried to you know, see what was going on. And in theory, it would even be really hard for my friend Jeff at the RCMP to read what's on that hard drive, because if it's good encryption, if it's good encryption, it, it should require state-sponsored attempts to crack it. Um, the, yeah, so that's uh, so I, I would I would definitely recommend that for any situation where uh, you have mobile information that could fall fall into the wrong hands. Um, you just don't want to forget your TrueCrypt password because <laughs> if you do, the device is now bricked 
it's 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 a brick and won't do anything useful for you at all. Um, Does that slow down your computer? No. The amazing thing about it is, uh, well, slow down. Maybe like a tiny bit in some ways, but it's not like a virus scanner that's like checking absolutely everything that goes on all the time. It's in some amazing transparent writing to disk that it's doing to, to handle all this, and the way it's working is at like an extremely low level. Uh, so I have, I have not found any, any problem at all on any device I've, I've used on from from that point of view. I mean, it, it certainly, when you think about it, it obviously must be doing a little bit more work than, than if you didn't have it. Um, but yeah, the, it's. The other thing is computers these days are so darn fast. If you tried to run this technology on something like 25 years ago, I don't think it would be performant. But computers are just so fast now uh, that you can do amazing things like this and it's sort of, to a, on, on human scale time, it's in, not noticeable. Would this work on a RAID set? Would it work on a RAID set? A RAID set is a special kind of disk setup that uses multiple hard drives. Um, it might work, well, okay, there's two ways of using TrueCrypt. We'll just geek out here for a second. Um, the simple way is you get that laptop home from Best Buy and you immediately install TrueCrypt and it covers the whole drive and you're done, you're good. The other thing you can do with TrueCrypt, now, so that might not work on the RAID because that's doing obviously specific things with the boot sector and, and who knows what, right? Um, so that might not work with the RAID array. But the other thing you can do with TrueCrypt is you can create uh, a virtual drive or a virtual partition. So you say, I want to allocate five gigs for my, you know, for my TrueCrypt partition. Um, so it goes and creates a five gigabyte encrypted file. And then when you turn on TrueCrypt, you say, I'm now going to mount my encrypted partition. And you point it at that file and there you go. So certainly at the application level, like in the operating system, you could have access to an encrypted space, but it wouldn't be the same as an encrypted drive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this may seem silly, but what if you put in the wrong password? Your finger slipped. Oh, uh, it'll, yeah. it'll let you do it a bunch of times. You, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I periodically get the wrong punctuation in my. It's on my wife's laptop, and I mess it up, and it keeps asking me again. And then I type it in again, and I make the same mistake. And I'm like. Barbara, what's the password for your computer? And it's just like, it's blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I know, I typed that. And it's like, so I do it again. But yeah, eventually I get it right and it lets me in. Um, or worst comes to worst, you power it off and start it up again. Uh, it, it, may, it may have a lockout. Like good security systems won't let people try forever to break into them. <laughs> so <laughs> it will lock you out at some point, I'm sure. But you know, a few tries is not a big deal. So yeah. Does that affect your applications that are on your computer? Does it like affect your applications? Yeah, like if you had, say, an no, it's totally transparent. That's like the guy was saying before about the performance and sort of how it affects the operations of your computer. It, uh, it seems to work very transparently and close to the physical disk. So uh, the other devices on your computer are none the wiser that it's communicating with an encrypted object. Yeah. Yeah. It also works with the role of partition level doing it on USB drives. Oh, yes, yes. Great point, yes. Yeah, so USB, you can also encrypt USB sticks with TrueCrypt, which is very good if you if you're carry, if you just want to carry the files. You're not carrying uh, the laptop with you to somewhere. You're just carrying a USB stick with stuff. Then, uh, yeah, there's ways you can use TrueCrypt to basically encrypt the USB stick. So when you, you know, drop it on the subway, you know, nobody can just plug it into their computer and see all the stuff that, that you've got. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a very, very good trick. Yeah, so I, a lot of times, when, whenever you hear in the media about, you know, this information was stolen from this website and 100,000 credit cards and all that kind of stuff, and a lot of the time, if you read the fine print on that, they'll talk about, well, what's the information encrypted, et cetera, like things like that. And a lot of the time, it's not. And, and you really wonder, like, who's setting up these things? Um, because encryption technology is really old. Like, the kind of encryption that runs uh, HTTPS was first invented by the NSA in the 1970s, but they couldn't tell anybody. So IBM invented it, unbeknownst to them, second, later in the 1970s, and like stuff like that um, has, has been going on for decades. Uh, and encryption and these associated technologies have been around for decades. But uh, even today, people are not using them to their full effect. So, Lucky you for going the great weather outside, being here and online, and you learned about this, and now your organization can be like light years ahead of 
you know, whoever is going to have an unfortunate media event in the future. Um, um, yes. Sorry. So on the topic of protecting your computer, could you speak a little bit to um, in-house servers versus ah, cloud servers? Why don't we talk about the cloud? We've got a whole oh. thing about the cloud. <laughs> Here we go. The cloud. I actually have a whole other presentation about the cloud, which is very fun. Um, but uh, the sort of brief overview of the cloud is the cloud is probably more secure than local storage systems that you're using right now. I, I say this as just a very broad general statement sort of on average because most local storage systems aren't being backed up regularly, uh, don't have redundant failures like this gentleman mentioned a RAID array. Your local server in your organization maybe just has one little hard drive there and not a redundant RAID array and so on. Um, so in theory, you know, what Google's doing to store all of its information in the cloud is uh, probably much better than whatever's going on in the one box under somebody's desk in your organization. Or even, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a larger organization, you maybe have a few servers, you maybe even have a real rack of servers, because real servers come in like this pizza box shape and you slide them into racks, which is where the term server rack comes from. So even if you have that though, you still need to be backing it up. You still need to be applying the SSL patch that we talked about earlier that you know, OpenSSL has this big vulnerability that everyone's supposed to be upgrading their servers now. So that's on you now to maintain that for your servers. Although you, you're probably thinking about file servers. So you know, that, that particular aspect's probably not necessarily relevant. Anyway, yeah. Um, local systems are not necessarily as secure because the cloud is supposed to be always up to date with the latest patches, best firewalls, has people monitoring the security logs all the time. Do you have somebody in your office that monitors that kind of stuff? Again, for a file server, access logs and security logs are not necessarily as, uh, as significant. But the backup aspect is definitely significant. Um, also, and this is something your local server just is never going to be able to touch you on uh, or touch the cloud on. Uh, it's super convenient to have access to all your stuff in the cloud, wherever you are, no matter what device you're using. I'm out with my phone and I can see that somebody's you know, done something with some file at work and then I go home and I'm on my desktop computer and I don't have to transfer that information from my phone, it's just in the cloud. So that is really easy. Um, but as I said before, how much convenience is worth how much risk because you know, there are cases where cloud providers have gone belly up. And then what happens to all the data that, that you entrusted to them? Um, I don't think, though, Google is going to go belly up anytime soon, or a lot of these other really big organizations that are in this space now. Um, there are also obvious privacy implications. Someone was asking earlier online, maybe the same person, about email on Google. You know, is it the same as having it on your computer? You know, there's obvious privacy implications when that information is out there on the, in the cloud. I mean, I should also just insert the punchline from my other presentation in here. The cloud is the new name for the internet. Whenever anybody says the cloud, just substitute in your head the word internet, because that's all it is. It's just a marketing term for the internet. I'm oversimplifying it a little bit because there are new ways we're using the internet that people then say that's the cloud because we're using these new techniques. But fundamentally, for most people, when you're thinking about these kind of scenarios, and you think, oh, my file's like in the cloud, just think it's on the internet, because <laughs> that's kind of really all it is. Uh, and it's, it, so there are therefore you know, obvious privacy issues, just like when anything on the internet, your email goes from Toronto to Vancouver through Chicago, uh, Google's got your email, uh, et cetera. You know, it's not yours anymore. But it's a communication medium, so unless you want to only communicate with people in a very small circle, you're going to take some of those risks no matter what. Uh, overall, um, I do think the cloud is it's totally here to stay. It's totally the way of the future. Mobile devices are not real computing devices, but they are excellent cloud communication devices. And the whole way in which people think about using information seems to be moving towards making sure it attaches to the cloud somehow. Um, so this stuff is here to stay, it's only going to get more advanced, and in fact, I think there's going to be technologies this year, next year, or the year after that you're going to want to start using, and there may be no other option than to use it in the cloud. Um, now, on the point of file server, the, 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 one of the critical things that organizations run into on this issue 
usually first is a question of, well, do we migrate our file server to Google Apps or something like that? Um, full disclosure, Freeform is a Google Apps reseller. So we will help you do that if you want to do that. Um, but there's, there are pros and cons to these things along the lines of what I just discussed. Um, for a small organization, the biggest issue is the lack of, you don't need to maintain that server anymore. You don't need to worry about the backups on that server anymore. That's really, I think, what's going to make the decision for most people. Um, for a larger organization, when you have the capacity to manage that server yourself, yeah, then it kind of depends. You know, how important is that information? Is it governed by privacy laws in Canada? How paranoid are the people in your organization, et cetera? So there's no one answer to that, but certainly long-term view is uh, it's all going into the cloud. Okay. Other things that people want to talk about? Yes. So I'm just curious on that topic, like when your yep. clients say to you, um, you know, what about privacy laws? What about, you know, is our client data going to be safe? What about this? What about that? You yep. know, these concerns about the cloud. How yep. would you address them? The number one thing we always bring up is, well, how secure do you think it is now? Because a lot of people are under the misguided assumption that because this computer has been under their desk for five years and no one's touched it except them and their boss or whatever, that it's like rock solid. Meanwhile, it's like Windows XP and it hasn't got any security patches for who knows how long. And it's the same computer they're using to connect to you know, other things on the internet. So it's probably got viruses and who knows what. Now that's kind of a worst case scenario. I'm sort of setting up a straw man there. But, but that case does exist. We've seen it. You know, and, uh, and even if people are being a little more diligent, there's still the issue of, uh, of, of the backups and of hardware redundancy and and the the other the other critical issue is the convenience. A lot of people, as they get more used to doing things on their phone, they get really frustrated that they can't get to their work file server on their phone. Now, actually, you probably can if you set up certain things in a certain way on your phone, um, but it's just not the same as if you've got the full Google Apps experience and you just hit on your phone like Google Drive and pull up the spreadsheet and stuff. So, you know that. that it, how, how do people quantify that? It, it just, it's got to depend on what's, what's the most important issue to them. Um, but, you know, originally the big thing that people had their backup about was uh, sort of the control and ownership and, and, and the security of their data. But in a lot of cases, for the things that are likely to happen, like the hard drive dies on that computer, chances are you'll have a better time dealing with that issue when it's in the cloud than if, if it's the local computer. Because if the hard drive fails on the computer in the cloud, you won't even know. Because they have such redundant systems that all that information is transparently moved to some other device automatically. It already was there as a duplicate copy. And it's just, you don't even worry about that anymore. There's also a licensing cost issue. For some organizations, it's a cost issue. Because maybe they pay a fortune for you know Microsoft's, well, to TechSoup, they don't have to pay a fortune. Um, but they may be paying for a whole bunch of access licenses. Like, cows aren't free through you guys, are they? Uh, they are. They are? Wow! Go to TechSoup. Cows are free. <laughs> that's it's free. They're like 2 or $3. OK, but that's next to, yeah, it's close to free. Because cows, for those of you who don't know, is the, I forget what it even stands for, but it's client like client access license. There we go. Thank you, Tony. So Microsoft wants to hit you all over the place for money. And they charge you per person who's accessing most of their systems. Uh, and for a lot of organizations, the sheer number of people who are accessing the number of uh, seats that they have to buy uh, makes the cost very high. And if they can move to something in the cloud for less, then that's good. But uh, you know, some cloud services still charge you per person. There's lots of different financial models to cloud services. And one of them is, yeah, they'll charge you per login. Uh, Google actually even does this. It's just very low. Um, like It's like $50 a year, I think, uh, for for Google Apps. So um, some organizations, it's, it's a security backup issue. Some organizations, it's a cost issue. Uh, some organizations, it's a convenience issue. Um, I, I didn't like Google Apps. So here's a tip about Google Apps. And Dropbox and other services have similar things like what I'm going to describe. I didn't like it a lot at first because I'm used to working on my desktop because I'm such an old fogey. Mm -hmm. and I open up my word processor and then I go file open and I find my file and I open it up and I work on it and then I save it. 
Uh, that's the old, old way of doing it. You can tell by the gray hair. Um, in the new way, in the cloud, there isn't even such a concept as a file or saving. Everything's like saved automatically and all that kind of stuff. So if you're working in your web browser, Google is great because you start a new spreadsheet and it's just there and you close your web browser and it's saved and like, hallelujah. Um, but if you're like me, and a lot of organizations have all these legacy files that they're moving and they're used to opening up in, in their word processor or whatever, then like what the heck do you do? Uh, well, there's programs, uh, there's a program for Google Apps and for, uh, you know, I know Dropbox has one and any, any sort of cloud storage service is going to have something like this where it'll basically synchronize everything that's in the cloud with a folder on your hard drive. So you basically have a local copy of everything that's out there as a file on your own computer. So then I can go file open and I can go there because it's on my computer and open the file and I'm happy. Um, and, and I can save things to there and they'll automatically get synced to the cloud. So my coworkers on their mobile devices and wherever they are, they can, they can get to that file that I just changed. That's really critical. If it wasn't for that sort of local to cloud sync, I think we'd be, there'd be a huge barrier for people doing a wholesale migration because their, their whole way of working would have to be totally different. But with that kind of sync, it can be pretty smooth. Yeah? Have any like bandwidth issues though? Well, yes. So in my whole presentation about the cloud, one of the main issues is the change in, uh, the change in where the costs go. So you lose, you, you, you don't have to pay any more for as many licenses for this and that and uh, buy as much software, uh, maintain as much stuff on personal computers. But yeah, your bandwidth costs are gonna go, well, yeah. we just uh, subscribed to Netflix at home and we immediately paid Bell the premium for unlimited bandwidth. Because as soon as you're pulling all those shows over the internet through Netflix, you're gonna blow through the minuscule amount of bandwidth that Bell wants to give you in no time. It's still a better deal than regular cable, unless you want current shows, but yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's trade-offs all over the place. And, and anything in the cloud, especially if it's to do with video, is like, uh, increase your bandwidth. Um, and this is an organizational issue that I think organizations are gonna have to grapple with more and more in the future as more people are teleworking, because the, I, I don't describe it as telecommuting, because it's like, it's not like you're, it's not like the office ne needs to be the hub of everything anymore. Because there are organizations like Freeform where we don't even have an office. Everything is virtual. Uh, so there's people who just sort of telework from wherever they are. And as that continues to be the case in more and more places, uh, organizations are going to have to think about things like, well, maybe we don't need as big an office, but we should be paying that premium for all of our staff to have the unlimited bandwidth through their home internet provider so that they can do all of this stuff for work from home with no issue. Because, yeah, there's barriers like that, that that are different than the barriers you have now. I think overall, they're probably a bit cheaper. I mean, if you, it scales in different ways because really big organizations also want to move to the cloud in, in, a, in a big way for different economies of scale reasons to do with the cost. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, the costs break out very differently than they do in, in the model we're used to. Yeah. Is there a difference between download and streaming in terms of bandwidth use? Uh, not really. The only thing that counts as far as bandwidth use goes is how many bits of information are being sent through the wire. Uh, streaming versus download is just sort of a different technique for pulling bits over the wire, but all that counts is how many bits are coming. Um, so if you're streaming a huge movie from Netflix, that's a lot of bits. That's tons of bits. And if it's like just your email, and yeah, it's just some text. It's not big deal. Yeah. May we take a quick view of the social media? Oh, yes, of course. Social media. Social media is also one of these things, kind of like payments, where, um, where it's a little bit outside of your control because you know, you're sending information to other people on their servers, on their websites. Number one thing is you pay attention to the privacy settings. These are the privacy settings, the, the little privacy panel in Facebook a couple years ago. Uh, it looks different now, and it's always different. They're adding and changing things. For those who, uh, I suspect everybody is aware, but in case anyone is not, uh, one of the things, why is it so important for a lot of social media stuff is you can control things like whether 
friends of friends see your updates and stuff like that. So you may be totally happy sharing things with other people that you know, but you may or may not be aware that depending on what you set up here, other people besides those that you know might learn about stuff. It, it, you know, it depends on it depends on the social media tool. It depends on what their settings are. But there's there's all kinds of ways that the information just goes all over the place like that. And um, you simply need to be aware of what the possibilities are and the tools you're using and take control over those. Now, what else do we have to say about that? Oh yes, and the most important rule about social media: once it's out there, you cannot take it back. Such as this famous tweet from a few years ago: Donald Trump, when Obama was reelected, blew a gasket online. Uh, he lost the popular vote by a lot and won the election. We should have a revolution in this country. Retweeted 12,000 times, and he later deleted this tweet, but it lives on forever. So, um, yeah, the bottom line for social media or anything on the internet, really, unless it's encrypted or you know under your control in some other way, I would consider it about as private as talking to your friends on the subway, really, especially social media stuff. Um, even, even when you send things to somebody, even just email. How many people have forwarded an email to somebody they didn't mean to forward the email to? Mm -hmm. uh, that's just kind of what happens on the internet. And in social media, it's really easy to do things like that. Sometimes things like that happen automatically. Or you hit reply all instead of reply. Or, you know, there's all kinds of ways that different technology, not just social media, lets you push information out there. So again, be, uh, be as paranoid as necessary to control uh, your information. You know, always double check when you send email. Okay, who is in the two line? I always, I've been doing this long enough that the last thing I do before I send any email is I reread the two line. Because if you send the wrong thing to the wrong person, bad <laughs> things can happen. Um, uh, a request is if yeah. you can jump into passwords. Passwords, yes. I'm, yes, passwords. We're talking about all this other esoteric stuff and we should get to some bedrock. Passwords. Passwords. This is what a secure password looks like. <laughs> All your passwords look like that, right? Don't they? Um, passwords. Yeah, uh, that is secure. Why is that a secure password and not, you know, password one, two, three, four, five? Um, the problem is not people sitting at the keyboard guessing your password. Um, well, and there are other problems like, say, that virus that got on your computer stealing the password and sending it off to somebody, so it doesn't matter how secure it is at that point. But uh, the problem is fundamentally not people that are going to guess your password. Like, frankly, you know, password 12345, you know, ampersand, number sign, exclamation mark is probably good enough to solve that problem, but that's not the problem. Uh, the problem is the, the most fundamental problem. Uh, especially in, when you want to talk about sort of best practices that your organization should be following for the information that it's securing. The most fundamental problem is people stealing lists of what's called hashes, which are basically encrypted passwords. If, uh, if an organization is doing what it should be doing, then when you create an account on a website, for example, uh, it will be creating a hash of your password, which is a type of encryption. It means that your pa they have your password in some kind of unreadable format. They cannot even read it to know what your password is, but they have this copy of your password. Now, people steal these lists because you read this stuff about how server X was broken into at company Y and all these account information was stolen, uh, and the, but the passwords were encrypted. Well, don't, 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 uh, don't sit on your laurels just yet um, because after they've stolen all the hashes, they then use computers, not even necessarily particularly fast computers these days, just any old computer will do. Uh, and they basically guess what all the passwords are. Well, with enough guesses, they can guess what most of the hashes are. Basically, create a guess, and they hash that, and then they check, is this hash the same as that one? Yes, okay, I know that I created this hash with this string of characters, therefore, this hash is that password. Now I will log into the website with that password. Um, that assumes they know the, ha the hashing mechanism that you're using, right? Well, yes, 
But if they've broken into the system to steal a list of hashes, they probably have access to everything they need to know to figure out what the hashing algorithm is. And the salt. And, you know, there's a link at the bottom that I recommend you check out because it's got a really awesome discussion of, of the issues there, um, which are non-trivial. It's true. Some of this is theoretical. Like, sort of, is, is, this is a fairly theoretical topic, password security, because you, for, for true password security, you kind of have to go to the wall because the theoretical issues to do with passwords are like so weird and complicated and, and, and what people can do with current computing technology is so amazing that we therefore have pushed passwords like way past their expiry date. Passwords as a security mechanism I think have been broken for several years but nobody knows what to replace them with so we're kind of stuck with it. This is a cartoon um, from a few years ago that uh, is fairly well known in password cracking circles uh, and basically, I won't, I won't read the whole thing because at the back I'm sure you, you can't see it there, but uh, you know, there's this idea of a typical password that people might uh, be used to thinking up. The word troubadour with some numbers and symbols substituted, and it's a certain length and there's a certain uh, range of characters that may or may not be included in such password, but it's only going to take, according to this estimate, three days at a thousand guesses a second for a computer to figure that out. Meanwhile, the person saying, uh, was it trombone or troubadour with one O as a zero or there was a symbol, but I forget what it was. So it's really hard to remember a password like that, um, but it's fairly easy for the computer to guess it. Uh, whereas the suggestion is if you make a really long password just with regular words, correct horse battery staple, it's much longer, it's much harder to guess. The estimate here was 550 years at a thousand guesses a second. <laughs> Uh, and if you make up some imaginary story like, here's a horse who says, that's a battery staple. Correct, it is. Because there's a little picture of a battery with a staple on it. Okay, that's a little obscure, but the idea is you get this sort of, just, just length, basically, will save you. Um, and the punchline is through 20 years of effort, we've trained people to make passwords that have, you know, must have a number and a symbol and uppercase and lowercase and blah, blah, blah. Like all those things we've all heard so many times, we train people to do that. But it's hard for people to remember. It's easy for people to guess. And if we just did other things, it would, you know, life would be better. Um, that's sort of true. Length is probably the most important thing in terms of password security. However, update from when I put this together originally. Um, almost nothing is hard for computers to guess anymore. Um, because with current GPUs, which are basically computers for graphics processing, uh, they turn out, turns out that aside from rendering 3D video games, they're really good at cracking passwords. Um, so with the right kind of computing equipment, attackers can actually make billions of guesses a second. So the estimate was 550 years at 1,000 guesses a second. Well, do the math if you can do a billion guesses a second instead of 1,000 goes down from 550 years really fast. Um, and here, this is, they'll, they'll be sharing the presentation and that's the link that I mentioned, which goes into quite a bit of detail about how crackers make mincemeat out of your passwords. Okay, so bottom line, readers should take pains to make sure their passwords are a minimum of 11 characters contain upper and lowercase letters and numbers, and this is the important part, and aren't part of a pattern, which is why we go back to the totally secure password at the beginning, which is totally random. The funny thing is, people who guess passwords for a living, or for an illegal living, um, <laughs> what they find is, if you steal a whole bunch of passwords from a place, and you start cracking a bunch of them, you'll see some patterns that are common in those passwords, because people who use a certain service tend to make passwords that follow a certain kind of pattern, because they're the same kind of people who like the same kind of stuff. So they actually feed that information into their password cracking algorithm, and it improves the accuracy of cracking the rest of the passwords. So you don't want your passwords to be part of any pattern that's discernible by anybody. You want them to be totally random. Okay, now that I've depressed the hell out of you and convinced you that passwords are just going the way of the dodo, um, well, a couple other points to be mindful of. Be careful what you let your browser remember for you. Uh, on my laptop, I don't have it remember any of my passwords. On my desktop, I'm kind of lazy, I, I admit. Uh, I, I do let my desktop remember certain things. But not my banking password. You know, nothing remembers the banking password, and so on. So, um, and 
in case it wasn't obvious, the laptop is like a no-no because -no somebody might walk away with it more easily than my desktop. Um, don't use the same password everywhere. Oh my goodness. Or at least not for anything you care about. Your banking password should be unique. You shouldn't use it anywhere else. Because if somebody does compromise any of your personal information and finds out your passwords, then the next thing they're probably going to do is they're going to try that password on every other thing that they know you have an account on. So don't use the same password anywhere that matters. I mean, maybe you don't care about social media, although the kind of damage to your reputation the social media hack can do is maybe those passwords are important too. Um, very important, two-factor authentication is now becoming more common. What is two-factor authentication? Uh, I have this set up for my Google accounts, so I will give you an example of what that means. If I go to Google on, say, this computer that I never used before, uh, I type in my username and password, and then Google says, please send us the authentication code that we just sent to your phone. So then I have to pull up my phone, and it messages me this code, and I type in the code, and then I can log in. And I have the option of forcing that to happen every time I use that computer, or if I trust that computer, I can say, give me a break for a month, and then ask me again after a month. Um, the reason this is really important is because if you think back to the Matt Honan example at the very beginning, um, if he had been using two-factor Google authentication, that would not have happened. Despite what Amazon did and what Apple did, at the point where they tried to get into his Google account, they would not have been able to do it. Because when they typed in, uh, they did the password reset, Google would have sent the authentication code to his phone, not to the attackers. And so they wouldn't have been able to complete the Google part of the process, and his stuff would have been safe. So two-factor authentication, the idea is there's basically two things you need, not just the password, there's something else. And ideally, it, uh, it should be, the idea is it's something you know and something you have. So you know the password, you have the phone, they authenticate that you have the phone by sending you a code to the phone, prove that it's you. Yeah? But being paranoid, will then have the phone number? Yes, Google definitely has your phone number. Yeah, you have to, you have to all praise the Google and give them your phone number to make, to make that happen. But, uh, you know, they, they're already reading all your email anyway. So, <laughs> there you go. Um, but it's not just Google. Like, there are, there are various services now that are starting to do two-factor authentication. And, um, like, Google was experimenting. I, I heard something a while ago. I haven't heard more about this recently. But they were experimenting with some kind of USB plug-in thing. So, kind of like the idea that something you have you have your phone, you get a code on there, or you have this USB key, and I plug the USB key into the laptop, and that identifies me as me. I type in my password, I plug in that, and then I'm good to go. And the idea is you can carry that around with you and use it into different devices. Yeah? Did they not, well, I know for a fact that years ago they used to have these random generating... Yeah, RSA tags. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, as far as I know, although corporate IT stuff is not my specialty, but as far as I'm aware, that is still fairly state of the art. There are those kind of things are still in use. Uh, RSA tags, what they are is um, uh, like a key fob, often it's on a key ring, or people have it like clipped to their, their security badge at work. And it's, uh, it's an, a seemingly random number that every like um, 20 seconds or something, new number just scrolls over. Um, but it's not actually random. It's somehow tied through you know, complicated mathematics back to your own user account at the organization. So when you sit down at work and log into your computer, you're supposed to type in the thing that you have at that moment on, on your key fob. And then that number plus your login gets you in. That's just a version of two-factor authentication. Just instead of sending a code to the phone, you're carrying the code with you all the time. And, and supposedly the generation of that, that code number is supposed to be, you know, unguessable, unbreakable. And then there's all kinds of people saying, but actually the NSA did this, that, and the other thing. And there's always somebody saying the NSA knows all. So, but the, but there, there's, there's something about that I remember reading a few years ago where people were wondering about whether it was truly random, et cetera, because when things aren't truly random, it's easier to break and so on. Yeah. Uh, oh, and key paths. Yes, passwords, the savior. This is kind of the savior. We use KeePass at work for all of our passwords. Where we're asking the question at, at the beginning, for what, what IT information would you be most concerned about if you had a security breach right now? In the case of Freeform, it would be KeePass. Because KeePass is everything. 
because we work with so many different organizations and have so many websites and servers and databases and like all these different things for all these different organizations, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands probably of passwords, I'm sure, um, that we can't remember them all. So they go into key paths because no one's sticking them in a Google spreadsheet and saving them on Google and like mm -hmm. readable. No, they have to be put in something that is a true password safe. So basically, to make a long story short, KeePass uses uh, encryption technology to create a little database with all the passwords in it. Uh, if you're into KeePass, then you've got the keys to the kingdom. Um, but it uses two-factor authentication and other techniques to make it safe, at least according to the best practices that people follow these days. And it's yeah. HTTP, not HTTPS? Oh, that's just where you get the software. It's not a web service. Uh, you you install. That's a good point. I should I should clarify that on this this part of the presentation. I try to make everything I say explicit so that people offline can read it. Um, but I haven't explained that part here. This is where you get the software. But uh, you then use it. You install it on your computer. Um, so it's kind of like the industrial strength version of writing all your passwords in Notepad, basically. So install it yep. and you, it's right. a file that you put your passwords in and then it's encrypted and then you yep. put your password in. Basically, yeah. So you, you, you install the KeePass software, you open the KeePass software, you say, I'm going to create a list of passwords and start making your list of passwords and save it. You come back tomorrow, you open it up, it asks you for all the authentication information to prove that you should be able to access it, and then it'll open it up and show you the list of passwords. It's basically, uh, basically how, what it does. Open source software? Open source. All, yeah, Prey, KeePass, uh, and uh, Tor are all open source. Tor is an amazing story because it was started by the US Navy, but it's open source. It's a very cool project. Um, the NSA hijacked it too. Well, yeah, and then there's all the stories about the NSA. Well, then they did literally actually use it to attack certain people in some ways, um, but uh, they, don't, they don't control it per se. Yeah, they, so the comment was in the NSA then hijacked for and, yeah. There's, there's many layers to these things, but it, it, it is, if you use it properly, it is okay. Um, so yeah, KeePass is, um, I mean, the nice thing about KeePass is you double click on the password in KeePass, it copies it to your clipboard. So you got 12 seconds after that to paste it into the website. So a lot of our passwords are like this long and crazy, random, truly secure passwords. What website? Oh, KeePass, sorry, did I say website? Yeah, you did. I, uh, if you use the KeePass software, uh, then all of our pa the, you can use whatever password you want because when you double click on the password in KeePass, uh, it copies it to your clipboard, and then you have that password in your clipboard even if it's like this long and totally unrememberable, but it's in your clipboard for 12 seconds. So you paste it then into uh, into the website that you want to get into, and away you go. So you can have like totally secure passwords if you're prepared to just copy paste them all the time, back and forth. But you know, for a personal level, for Facebook, you maybe don't want to do that. Depending how paranoid you are, maybe you should. But for an organization, uh, for certain things, maybe you really should be doing something like that. Because the the alternative is like you're writing them down somewhere. Or like, what do you do? What do you do when you have to give a password to her, for example? Yeah. So what you have what what password manager do you? Um, use? I currently use Passpack, but. Yeah. Okay, so we have, we have no standard at TechSoup for <laughs> storing passwords. We have different people doing their own thing, and if you need to give one to her that she doesn't have, you don't email it to her, do you? No. Good. Don't email passwords to anybody. This is one of my big pet peeves. We, we start work with clients, and, and we tell them, uh, so we'll need the webmaster username and password for your website because we need to log in to do the things that you've asked us to do. And they say, great, I'll email that to you. And I say, no, please don't email it to me. <laughs> because like, email is not encrypted. It's, there's no security around email at all. Um, there's this concept of security by obscurity, where like, you think, yeah, but who cares what our passwords are? And yeah, like 99.999% of the time, you're probably right, because you're not protecting the secret formula to Coca-Cola. But it's not a matter of whether you're probably right about that. It's like. What should you be doing? Because the one time that it counts, that's you know that's when your pants are going to be down. So, uh, yeah, we we I ask people to phone me, just phone me the password and tell me, and I will like type it into our key pass, 
as you tell me, and then we're good. Um, but you know, or or do it, you know, do it some other way. There are things like uh, uh, supposedly uh, Skype and other online messaging systems encrypt their traffic back and forth. So some people want to use services like that for that kind of exchange. But yeah, you. You know, and even, even within the office, uh, it's an important thing to think about because there are, there are cases where if you had a bunch of passwords that she didn't have and vice versa, you would just email them to her. Like a lot of people just, it's the default normal thing that they think about doing because they email everybody all the time about everything. Uh, but that's, you know, you don't want to do that. Text. What's that? Or text. Yeah, well text, yeah, texting. And cert so certain, yeah, certain texting programs do encrypt, like uh, BlackBerry Messenger, I believe, encrypts end to end. Um, but uh, yeah, not not all of them do. Same with credit card numbers. Don't email them. Yeah, for exactly the same reason. Don't email your credit card number to people. Um, but again, that that happens too. Um, phone is still like old technology, like the phone is still actually surprisingly robust as far as a lot of these concerns go. Um, we haven't talked about protecting your website. Or, oh, is that it? Okay. I think that's it. that's it. Do we have enough time? Are we good? Uh, we should probably, yeah, I think we, we actually just hit the upper limit. Of we hit the upper limit. Yeah, but oh. if you could quickly go There's through. not a lot with this one anyway, because it's not something that you yourself can necessarily do a whole lot about. So quickly, protecting your website. Hacked by the Punisher. This was, uh, this is actually the first organization that asked me to do this talk, and they had been hacked. <laughs> Um, so that was a quaint example of what you don't want to happen. But the fact is, that is very quaint because nobody hacks websites to do that anymore. Um, uh, basically, what you want to, like what, what people do to hack websites now, just to, this isn't what this text is talking about, defacing websites and sort of taking them over is sort of, you know, a funny thing that kids did like way back when. But, now, when your website gets hacked, like if the password gets stolen off your computer by a virus and sent somewhere and somebody logs into your website to do who knows what, they're probably doing it to deploy some secret thing on your website that they don't want you to know about. Because then they're sending spam messages to a billion people and those links in the spam messages have to go somewhere to download the bad software. So they want to put the bad software on your website. So that when people click the link and get the bad software, they're getting it from you and not from anything that can be traced back to them, for example. And you don't want your website to be serving up spam virus stuff. Uh, so, you know, people, I think, have this historical view that, you know, our website got hacked and it looks like this, but that's not really what happens in most hacks anymore. Um, so, briefly, you want to have someone who knows what they're doing, keep the site up to date with security patches. Because whatever software you're using for your website, there's probably patches. We talked about the OpenSSL password, uh, OpenSSL patch earlier, and there's all kinds of things like that that you need to be applying on a regular basis. Most of the attacks that happen on websites are automatic. They're not people trying stuff out. They're computer programs that are automatically trying to apply uh, various attacks to the website. So if you take advantage, they try to take advantage of the known holes that have known fixes. If you've applied all the fixes, you're probably good to go. Um, Make sure that all the computers where anyone makes changes to the website are completely clean and secure, as we talked about before. And possibly, depending how paranoid you are, set aside one computer as the computer from which people maintain the website and nobody does anything else with that computer. Um, use strong passwords for all access points to the website. So this means FTP, server control panel, website administrator accounts, etc. And make sure the people who are building your website understand what XSS or cross-site scripting a SQL injection and CSERF mean, uh, which I won't explain now, but I can explain to you later if you really want to know. People who run your websites really should know what those things mean because those are common ways that websites get attacked. You want to make sure they're building around them and securing it properly. All right. And that's you. it. That was crazy um, in a nutshell. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for um, taking the time to come out and listen to Thanks, Joyce. And thank you, everyone, in Internet Man. Here's oh. a little gift for a you. A textbook. Yeah, and chocolate. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.